something like to call the matter? In the matter of a fishery trustee in bankruptcy, as trustee of the bankrupt estate of Ken and Jen, the High Court of Australia is now in session. The court will now take the floor. May it please the court, Hai Chu Zhu, Z-H-U, joined by my learned junior, Declan Noble, N-O-B-L-E. We appear for the appellant, the trustee in bankruptcy of Penn. We'll each speak for 22 minutes and we reserve one minute by way of rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Mr. May it please the court. Your honours, Miss Wade, W-A-D-E, for the respondent. I appear today with my learned junior counsel, Hetherington, H-E-T-H-E-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. I will be speaking for 25 minutes. My learned junior colleague will be speaking for 19 minutes and we reserve one minute for Sir Rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Ms. Wade. Ms. Anne. Yes, Ms. Anne. May it please the court. The appellant, Penn's trustee in bankruptcy, is unable to fulfill its obligations to Penn's creditors. This is because at trial, Justice Sang erred in failing to find that there was a trust relationship between Penn and the respondent, Den. The appellant comes before the court today seeking a declaration that Penn has a beneficial interest in the house to which Penn contributed a substantial portion of the purchase money. It falls to this court to determine three issues of law, and we will address these issues through three submissions. First, a resulting trust arose when Penn and Den purchased the property in 2002, and this resulting trust survived the transfer of Penn's interest to Den in 2016. Second, in the alternative, the transfer gave rise to a trust in favor of Penn. And third, there are no grounds which would compel this court to exercise its discretion and refuse to recognize a trust as made out. Yes. So I turn then to our first submission, that a resulting trust arose when the parties purchased the property in 2002. The principle on resulting trusts was enunciated by this court in the 1984 case of Calvary and Green. I quote Chief Justice Gibbs in that case. If two persons have contributed the purchase money in unequal shares, and a property is purchased in their joint names, there is a presumption that the property is held by the purchasers in trust for themselves as tenants in common in the proportions in which they contributed the purchase money. That was reported at volume 155 of the Commonwealth Law Reports, commencing at page 242, and that quote itself is at pages 246 to 7. If the court pleases, may we dispense with formal citations? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Your Honour. Now the parties agree that the presumption of resulting trust is prima facie enlivened, and I would point to the respondent's written submissions at paragraph 1.1.3. This is because Penn and Den made unequal contributions to the purchase price. If we look at paragraph three of the facts, we're told that Penn and Den were jointly liable under an $800,000 mortgage. However, it was Penn who contributed the entirety of the $200,000 deposit that went to the acquisition of the house. However, the respondent contends that before this court can consider the presumption of resulting trust, a further presumption, that of advancement, arises instead, and this negatives any resulting trust. This is their submission 1.3 in their written submissions. Now, the principle in relation to the presumption of advancement was also articulated by this court in the case of Nelson and Nelson in 1995. In their joint judgment, Justices Dean and Gummo said, there are certain relationships from which equity infers that any benefit provided for one party at the cost of the other has been provided by way of advancement. The consequence is that the equitable estate follows the legal estate and is at home with a legal title. It's the appellant's submission that this presumption of advancement is not enlivened. Penn did not gift to Den that portion of the deposit 
which is not reflected in Penn's legal title. Do you submit that the relationship between Penn and Deng was one that would give rise to a presumption of advancement? No, Your Honour. We submit that Penn and Den's relationship is one which equity has not traditionally recognised as attracting the presumption of advancement. Are the categories closed? No, Your Honour. However, we would submit that this court should not expand the categories. And this is for a few reasons. So, the first reason that we give is that the rationale which supports the presumption of advancement does not also support the extension of that presumption to the present circumstances. We point to the traditional rationale given by uh, Master of the Rolls Jessel in the case of Bennett and Bennett from the Chancery Division in uh, 1879. And that was that the presumption of advancement is attracted when the relationship between the parties is one where one party has a moral obligation to give to another or a natural obligation to provide for that other. Has the world moved on since 1879, Miss yeah, it certainly has, Your Honour. However, we would say that uh, Master of the Royal Jessel's uh, observations in that case were approved by this court in the 1995 case of Nelson and Nelson. We do note that an additional modern rationale has been proposed, yes. first by Chief Justice Dixon in the 1956 case of Worth and Worth, and then later also picked up on by uh, Chief Justice Gibbs in Calvary and Green in 1984. This more modern rationale is that there's a greater prima facie probability of a beneficial interest being intended in the situation to which the presumption is applied. However, I would cite two authorities where in both cases the judges have noted that this new modern rationale is yet to be accepted and that we are to remain applying the traditional moral rationale. The first case I would refer to is a decision of Justice Edelman, as he then was, of the Western Australian Supreme Court in Anderson and McPherson No. 2. That was in 2012. It's a shame His Honour was not available to sit today. <laughs> a pity, Your Honour. The other case he would cite is a case in 2012 from the New South Wales Supreme Court, and that was the judgment of Her Honour Justice Ward in Ryan and Ryan. In those two cases, their honours looked at the history of the rationale provided for the presumption of advancement and found that while both Chief Justices Dixon and Gibbs had given this new modern interpretation, nevertheless the authority of the case law is still the traditional rationale of the moral obligation to give. Now based on that traditional rationale, the presumption of advancement would not apply in these current circumstances. We point to the fact that Penn and Den are a same-sex couple. Previously, the rationale applied because the parties were different in some way. For example, a parent was different to their child and was morally obliged to provide for their child. Or perhaps a husband was morally obliged to provide for his wife. But where we have one party of the same sex providing to their partner of their same sex, it's difficult to infer any sort of moral obligation to give. There's no direction which would suggest a presumption of advancement. Is there a presumption of advancement from wife to husband? No, Your Honour. And we'll no moral obligation from a wife towards her husband? Equity has not recognised one, Your Honour. And we would look to... <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, equity hasn't found a moral obligation sufficient to justify extending the presumption of advancement from husband to wife and we would consider the High Court case of trustee of property of Cummins and Cummins as authority for that. Because if there had been recognised to be a reciprocal moral obligation in the husband and wife situation, it would be difficult, would it not, for you to argue it would not also, also apply to a de facto same-sex couple? Yes, Your Honour, particularly... It, and, and sorry, and can I just add to that, does the relationship, does the presumption of advancement, has it been recognised as applying to... Or, de facto couples not in a same-sex relationship? In response, Your Honour, if the presumption of advancement were found to apply from wife to husband, then it would be difficult for us to resist extending it to a same-sex relationship. However, we would still rely on the fact that Penn and Den are a de facto couple and equity has not yet extended the presumption of advancement to a de facto couple, relying again on the case of Ryan and Ryan from the Supreme Court in 2012. Uh, we would point further to the, the fact that equity follows the law. Of course, 
the law has moved on and social attitudes have moved on since 1984 when the High Court said that the presumption does not apply to de facto couples. However, those changes don't justify the court expanding the presumption so that it applies in these present circumstances. So looking first to the changes in the law, since 1984, there have been two significant legislative developments. In New South Wales, that was the enactment of the Property Relationships Act 1984. This was to implement the New South Wales Law Reform Commission's recommendations in their report on de facto couples. And in that report, the Law Reform Commission expressly stated that it was not adopting a policy of legal equivalence between de facto couples and married couples. Subsequently, in 2008, the Commonwealth Legislature enacted the Family Law De Facto Financial Matters and Other Measures Act. And this was to create a uniform nationwide family law policy which would extend the power of the family law courts to de facto couples and not merely married uh, couples. However, again, there the Legislature was emphatic that it was treating married couples and de facto couples as different things. Given that the law still retains this distinction between marriage and a de facto relationship, so too should equity. Of course, social uh, developments have also been felt since 1984, but again, these don't justify the expansion of the presumption of advancement. Many courts have criticised the presumption of advancement as anachronistic, that it doesn't accord with social expectations and that it's out of date. Well, I think Justice Hayden doesn't think it's a presumption at all. Perhaps, Your Honour, however, there are a number of other authorities which do treat it as a presumption, or to use the words of uh, Justice Dean in Mishinsky and Dodds, something of a civil onus of proof, so capable of being rebutted on the facts. However, if previous courts have pr uh, previously said that this presumption is anachronistic, then the solution is not to expand it further, it's simply to let it stay as it is and to wait for the legislature to abolish it, if that is what is necessary. For these reasons, the presumption of advancement does not apply in this case. The resulting trust therefore arises. Now the respondents contend that the resulting trust is rebutted on the facts and the onus rests on them to prove that this is the case. It's our submission that they have not done this. The respondents first rely in their written submissions on an inference which was applied by this court to a matrimonial relationship. In the 2006 case, the trustee of the property of Cummins and Cummins, the court inferred that the parties likely intended to hold beneficial title jointly because the parties had purchased the property as a matrimonial home, because they'd each made contributions to the purchase price, and because title was made in their joint, taken in their joint names. On the facts as we have available to us, only one of those factors is actually made out, which is that the parties contributed to the purchase price. Except this factor is exactly what gives rise to the resulting trust. It can't be relied on to rebut it. Considering the other two factors, so firstly, that the parties had purchased a matrimonial home. As Your Honour noted, Penn and Den are a de facto couple. Accordingly, that particular factor is missing in this case. And I note that in that case, their honours did place significant weight on the subsisting marital relationship between Cummins and Cummins. Seth, um, Ms. Sue, I was just going to ask a question, which is in relation to distinguishing marriage or de facto couple as we have here, is the distinction quite so relevant if, we're, if we accept that there is no presumption of advancement and go back to the question of is there a presumed resulting trust? Um, and earlier in your submissions, you said that an unequal contribution to purchase price alone enlivens the presumption of resulting trust. Um, if you take into account later cases, including Cummins as well as Anderson and McPherson, which you mentioned, those cases refer to the existence of a resulting trust turning not only on unequal contributions to purchase price, but also an absence of intention to benefit. And the relevance to which is that if we look to the facts as set out in section or paragraph three, is it possible to say that Penn and Den themselves considered themselves 
in a matrimonial relationship and that the home was acquired for the purposes of this matrimonial relationship, irrespective of what society says about that relationship. Their own intentions, objectively manifested, was that this was the matrimonial home. And then how do we distinguish that from these case authorities, particularly Cummins, which said, well, we can, in, we can look to and find evidence, positive evidence of an intention to benefit when there is contributions towards a matrimonial home. Two points in response to your honours question. Our first is that at paragraph one, we're told that Penn and Den have chosen not to marry. So we know that they turned their minds to the possibility of marriage and decided against it. Our is second that, point, is that relevant if it was not possible? Of course, Your Honour, we do know that uh, same-sex marriage was only legalised recently and that at that time it wasn't an option. But it's still evidence that they turned their minds to it, that they considered the status of their relationship and that they determined that it wasn't on the same level as marriage. However, we would point to other factors which point <coughs> against any intention of joint ownership. And this is that Penn's contribution to the deposit came from personal funds. So this means that at the time that they purchased the property, Penn's assets were kept separately from Den's assets. They weren't sharing their assets at that time. This suggests that they decided that their benefits were intended to be kept separate and that that separation of assets should continue even with the purchase of the property. For these reasons, the resulting trust is not rebutted on the facts. If this is the case, then this means that at purchase, the two parties, although registered as, uh, as proprietors of the property on the Torrens Register, they held their legal title in equitable shares in common of 60 and 40%. On the facts, in 2016, Penn then transferred their interest to Den. On our submission, this transfer did not affect the resulting trust in any way. And this is because of statute. Section 23, capital C, 1A of the Conveyancing Act 1919 states that no interest in land can be created or disposed of except by writing signed by the person creating or conveying the same. If this court finds that there was a resulting trust at the point of purchase, then later, when Penn tried to transfer their interest to Den, in the absence of any writing about a disposition of an equitable interest, this provision of the statute prevents that equitable interest from moving, even if Penn transferred their legal title to Den, which we are told on the facts occurred, because there was no writing recording the disposition of Penn's equitable interest, that equitable interest under the resulting trust remained with Penn. And what do you say the equitable interest that remained with Penn after the transfer was? A 10% interest being the difference between the 50% that he held on, as, as legal owner, registered proprietor on the title, and the 60% you say equitable interest that he had as a result of the resulting trust, the purchase money resulting trust? We say that the 60% equitable interest was left behind. So prior well, to transfer... Well, you have writing. You have writing for the 50%. Uh, not quite, Your Honour. So don't you? Don't you have a transfer? Don't you have a signed transfer? Yes, Your Honour. However... Well, isn't that right? Yes. Yes. But the transfer and on our... And we have infeasibility of title, so once that's registered, there won't be a difficulty with, with any lack of writing beforehand. Two points in response, Your Honour. So firstly... Yeah. Uh, the full 60% of Penn's interest would have been left behind. And this is because the 50% of Penn's legal interest was not at home and commensurate with the 60% equitable interest. And there are no authorities to the effect that, to the extent that the legal interest is commensurate with the equitable interest, so the 50%, then that 50% is merged together into a single legal absolute estate, leaving the 10% remaining. It's simply the 50% legal interest and the 60% equitable interest. So that entire 60% equitable interest was left behind. Secondly, in relation to Your Honour's point on indefeasibility, it is certainly the case that Section 42 of the Real Property Act confers indefeasibility on the registered proprietor. However, the in personam exception to the indefeasibility rule would arise in this case. If there is this sort of a trust relationship, then Penn can assert rights in personam 
against Den. Den being the registered proprietor would therefore be subject still, nevertheless, to Penn's equitable interest. So that arises in relation to conduct, the conduct of the registered proprietor occurring after registration of title. Whereas your, on your case of a resulting trust, this is in relation to conduct occurring prior to registration of title. Not quite, Your Honour. We would refer, for example, to the case of Byron Nicolay, where the court, the High Court in that case, found that although at the time that the party was registered, they might have completely intended to honour their personal obligations, nevertheless, afterwards when they resiled, that was when the fraud and the in personam exception was enlivened, and therefore that the, par um, the party seeking to assert an unregistered interest in the property was able to do so. <coughs> Based on this submission, the transfer did not affect the resulting trust. If the court accepts this submission, this alone disposes of the appeal in favour of the appellant. All our other submissions from here, including those of my learned junior, are in the alternative to this one key submission. Now, if this court finds that there was no subsisting trust at the time of transfer, then we do agree that what was transferred was Penn's entire absolute legal interest. However, we say that that transfer was on trust. We rely on three different alternative trusts, that of an express trust, a common intention trust, and a Baumgartner-style remedial constructive trust. I'll deal first with the express trust. The parties are agreed on the law to be applied here, which is that the three certainties must be made out. And the crucial issue for this court to determine is whether certainty of intention is made out. On our submission, certainty of intention is made out. The respondents have submitted that Penn is the settlor and that Penn's intention alone is relevant. However, the appellant leaves open to the court to determine whether Penn or Den was the settlor of the trust, either Penn in transferring the trust, in transferring the property, sorry, on trust for themselves, or Den prospectively declaring a trust before receiving the property. In either case, the parties had the same intention and were ad idem. And as evidence of this, we would point to paragraph nine of the facts, where we're told that Penn and Den had this conversation. Den said, why don't you transfer legal title in the Collins Street house to me? Just for me to hold for the both of us to make sure that the property will be safe in case you get sued by Bix or the tax man. Penn then replies, yes, that's a good idea. The parties are ad idem, and moreover, they're ad idem that Den would be Penn's trustee. There are several words which objectively indicate this was their intention. So first, Den says, to hold for both of us. These words have been found in previous cases to give rise to a trust. Would point, for example, to the Victorian Court of Appeal case of Harper and Levi in 2007, or a similar case from the UK uh, House of Lords in Paul and Constance. Another indication is the fact that Den only refers to legal title. Finally, the purpose of the transaction was to conceal and not destroy Penn's beneficial interest. For these reasons, the parties contemplated a trust. Certainty of intention is made out, and this court should find an express trust in favour of Den at transfer. If there are no further questions, Your Honour, I defer to is there a, Is there a difficulty if the intention underlying the transfer is to conceal assets from the tax man or to render one party's assets unavailable to creditors? No, Your Honour, and this is because in the, uh, in the decision of this court in Nelson and Nelson, illegality and improper purposes do not necessarily void any underlying trust. My junior would deal with these in yes. his submissions, yes. Thank you, Ms. Sam. Yes. Thank you, Your Honour. Thank you. May it please the court. Your Honours, I make two principal submissions. The first follows closely on those of my senior, and it is that if this court does not find 
or does not recognise a resulting trust or an express trust of the kind my leader argued for, then nevertheless it should recognise either a common intention constructive trust <coughs> or a Baumgartner style joint endeavour constructive trust. My second submission is that there are no grounds for denial of equitable relief to the appellant. I turn then to my first submission and to the first limb of that submission that this court should recognise a common intention trust. It is well established that equity will give effect to a common intention in respect of the beneficial ownership of property by way of a common intention trust in circumstances where a party has acted to their detriment uh, in accordance with that common intention. And Your Honour's authority for that proposition is the 1977 New South Wales Court of Appeal case of Allen and Schneider, which was affirmed in this court in 1987 in Baumgartner and Baumgartner. An important point of difference, Your Honours, between this argument and the argument of my senior is that there is a lower threshold in the sense that in respect of constructive trusts of this kind, um, certainty of intention to create a trust need not be made out, only intention that both parties have beneficial ownership in the property. In the present case, Penn and Den did share a common intention from the original acquisition of the property until after the transfer on the 25th of September 2016, that they would each hold a beneficial share in the property. Common intention is a question of fact to be inferred from the party's words and conduct. Your Honours, there are four factors prior to transfer that evince a common intention of this kind. The first is that the property was registered in the party's joint names. The second is that the couple acquired and lived in the property as a family home, which contemplates, contemplates they saw it as property they lived in um, and owned together. The third is that both made substantial contributions to acquisition of the property, and indeed, as my um, leader has, has, has suggested and uh, has explained, the contributions of Penn uh, were significantly larger. I note merely by way of illustration that these three factors uh, were also essential to the finding of a common intention in the federal court case of Prentice and Cummins um, in 2003. But there is a fourth factor in this case, Your Honours, and that is that the, the couple made equal repayments to the loan for which they were jointly liable. Can, can I just interrupt you there for can I, I just want to clarify one thing. The four factors that you're relying upon are factors prior to the transfer of the of Penn's 50% interest in the property to Den. Indeed, John. So you, are you arguing for a common intention constructive trust as from the outset of acquisition of the property? In the alternative to my leader's arguments in respect of a resulting trust. So if you do not find for that, then yes, from the outset there was a, benef there was a common intention that both parties would share a 50-50 beneficial interest in the property. Not a common intention constructive trust arising at the time of the 2016 transfer. It is our submission that the common intention existed from the beginning and that the transfer did nothing to disturb that common intention with the consequence that after the transfer there remained a common intention constructive trust. And Your Honours, there are three reasons why this common intention um, subsisting from the time of acquisition, which I have just established, was not disturbed by the transfer. The first um, is the words used by Den, um, the words to which Penn agreed on that conversation on the 16th of September, principally just for me to hold for the both of us. Well, so, but sorry, we, I think we need to be careful here. That's a conversation that, that's dealing with the subsequent transfer, not the initial acquisition. I, indeed, Your Honour, it is, it is our submission that a common intention existed from the point of acquisition all the way until after the transfer on the, 16th, oh, on the 25th of September. And so those words on the 16th of September show yes. that the transfer that the parties eventually effected did not disturb the prior common intention in respect of their um, uh, respective beneficial shares in the property. Yes. And for that, for that reason, the words on the 16th of September, specifically just for me to hold for the both of us, indicate that it was the party's continuing common intention that they would each hold a 50% beneficial share in the property. And this would be in align with how they registered legal title in 2002 to begin with? Indeed, precisely. Which would rather tell against the, the resulting That's trust, right. would it not? If the intention from the outset was an intention that they would hold beneficially 50-50, 
that intention would be sufficient, would it not, to displace the result, presumption of resulting trust? We submit that. Yes. Yes, yeah. the, the, the factors you're relying on to indicate a common intention constructive trust prove positively the presence of an intention. In that case, uh, in that case, Your Honours, uh, we would submit that that intention grew over the years and that at the point of transfer it crystallised. Um, and that is principally because of the words spoken on the 16th of September. If it was the party's common intention before the conversation that each was to hold a beneficial interest in the property, then Den's qualification is a clear indication that the parties did not intend the transfer to disturb that state of affairs. Uh, the second reason is again to be found in the words of Den in that conversation, um, specifically in Den's specification of legal title. This is of an intention that Penn was to retain some title, that is equitable title, after the transfer. The third reason is the purpose of the transfer to which Penn and Den agreed, which was to make sure, in Den's words, the property will be safe in Penn if Penn gets sued. This purpose is consistent with a common intention that Penn and Den were to bo both hold a beneficial interest in the property subsequent to the transfer. The purpose of Den's, or the, the purpose was that Penn's interest in the property would be concealed, not destroyed by the transfer. And it was in reliance on this common intention, Your Honours, that Penn acted to their detriment, principally by transferring their interest to Den. For in making the transfer, Penn had, and I quote His Honour Justice Gleeson in 1989 in the case of Green and Green in the New South Wales Court of Appeal, the reasonable belief that by so acting they were acquiring a beneficial interest in the land. That is what Penn believed at the time the transfer was made. Sorry, your, sum your submission is that by transferring the legal title, Penn believed that Penn was acquiring a ben beneficial interest in the property. Indeed. Beca because of the conversations and the common intention that you say Christ grew and crystallised. That's precisely the, the argument, Your Honour. Um, perhaps it could say that, perhaps it could be said that Penn believed they were retaining a beneficial interest in the property, but of course parties need not have precise knowledge as to the legal operation of their transactions and it was enough that Penn acted to their detriment by making the transfer of legal title. And insofar as you place weight on the reference to legal title as opposed to beneficial title, Penn is not legally qualified, is he? Uh, he is not, but we submit that for someone to have lived with a commercial barrister for all this time <laughs> and someone... Osmosis. Someone, uh, precisely, <laughs> intellectual, learning by osmosis, Your Honour, is what we submit um, occurred here. Um, and to the extent that some of this exchange has been in relation to the timing from when the common intention constructive trust arises, leaving aside whether or not it's inconsistent with the submissions for resulting trust, if, what is the, what is the significance between finding that the common intention constructive trust arises either from 2002, leaving aside the problems that may present for a resulting trust, to if it arises on the tra point of transfer um, on the 15th of September in 2016? The difference, Your Honour, is a question of proportion. Um, well, in fact, in, in both instances, the proportion would be 50-50, uh, indeed. Um, but if, if Your Honours find it still is a question of proportion in the sense that if Your Honours find um, that there was no common intention early on towards the, the point of acquisition then and <coughs> also find in favour our resulting trust argument, then the proportions would be 60-40. But if instead this court has to turn to the alternatives, then on this constructive trust argument the proportions would be 50-50. And there would be no other significance as between finding that it arises in 2002 or 2016? Not that I am aware, uh, am aware of, Your Honour. I turn then to the second limb of this submission, which is that the court should, in the alternative, recognise a joint endeavour, constructive trust. And at the core of this kind of constructive trust, Your Honours, is unconscionability. And at the core of our argument on this point is that it would be unconscionable for Den to rely on the face of the register to assert an interest in the property, where Penn has made by far the larger share of contributions in financial terms. The relevant principle, Your Honours, is that where parties have contributed to the acquisition and maintenance of property on the basis of a joint endeavour which fails without attributable fault, equity will intervene if it will be unconscionable for one party to insert the entire interest in the property upon failure of that endeavour. And of course, authority for this proposition is the 1985 
decision of this court in Machinsky and Dodds uh, and the 1987 decision of Baumgartner and Baumgartner. What do you say is the meaning of without attributable blame in this context? Your Honour, it is our submission that attributable blame goes to the question of, of unconscionability. Uh, and on this point, um, we would refer to Your Honour's decision in the New South Wales Supreme Court uh, in, uh, in the case of Austin and Hornby in 2011, where Your, where Your Honour said that um, though that comment without attributable blame uh, was made in Machinsky and Dodds as a separate inquiry to the unconscionability inquiry, that in fact it is at home there and it belongs there as a question of unconscionability. Um, we say that there is no attributable blame here, or at least not enough that would render it unconscionable for Penn now to assert um, a beneficial interest in the property, and that is for several reasons. The first is that it has long been recognised that the concept of attributable blame should not be applied with severity in the context of a breakdown of familial relationships. And authority for this, Your Honours, is the 2004 New South Wales Supreme Court case of Creases and Creases, which has been applied in a number of other cases. Um, the second point to make is that the infidelity in this case was, while improper, only emotional infidelity. It was not as gross as it could have been or uh, of so gross a kind as to render Penn's claims now unconscionable. Uh, indeed, it might be described um, in the words of Justice Bryson in 1995, New South Wales Supreme Court case of Schmutz and Arras, as a human phenomenon which sometimes occurs. And for that reason, it is not high enough to render Penn's current, cla current claims unconscionable. Turning, however, to the issue of the joint endeavour in the present case, um, it is important to recognise that the effect of not imposing a constructive trust in the present case is that Den would make a windfall out of the transfer, despite the fact that Penn has made by far the largest share of financial contributions. Plainly, at the time of the purchase of the property, Penn and Den were parties to a joint endeavour, which was their committed and loving relationship. There are four reasons that the property was part of this joint endeavour. The first is that the property was purchased as a family home, that this decision to purchase the property was reached jointly suggests strongly that the parties contemplated the significance of the property to their joint endeavour, to their relationship. The second factor is that Penn and Den were jointly liable under the mortgage. The third um, is that given the magnitude of Penn's contribution to the acquisition of the property, more than half its purchase price, it would be unconscionable for Den to assert that it was rendered, in effect, a mere gift by operation of the transfer. And the fourth is that registration of both Penn and Den as proprietors of the property is a strong indication that they consider the property would be central uh, to their joint endeavour. And by way of illustration, I note that in the 2012 New South Wales Supreme Court case of Payne and Rowe, Justice Ball saw joint registration as strongly supporting the inference that the property, the familial home, was uh, part of the couple's joint relationship. And these factors are applicable here in the de facto situation? the submissions that were made by senior counsel? They are indeed, and that, Your Honour, is because in cases like Machinsky and Dodds and Baumgartner and Baumgartner, which are specifically concerned with this type of constructive trust, courts have made no distinction between married couples and de facto couples. The question is simply whether it is unconscionable now for the party whose name is on the register to assert an entire beneficial interest in the property, notwithstanding the contributions of the other party. And what does the, the fact that there's now a trusting in bankruptcy do to affect, if at all, that assessment of what would be unconscionable? Because, Your Honour, the trustee in bankruptcy stands in effect, um, and in most instances in the shoes of the bankrupt themselves, uh, the rights of equity that the, um, uh, that the bankrupt would have had, the trustee also has. And so unconscionability, unconscionability should be considered with reference to the position of the bankrupt pen. Uh, it is our submission, Your Honours, that the transfer did nothing to disturb this joint endeavour. Uh, the principal reason for this is that the only consequence of the transfer was to change the face of the Torrens Register. Um, joint endeavour constructed trusts are imposed regardless of intention, and authority for that, of course, is Baumgartner and Baumgartner. The second reason is that both parties remained jointly liable under the mortgage even after the transfer and indeed continued to pay mortgage repayments notwithstanding the transfer. This indicates that even after the transfer, the property remained part of their joint endeavour. A further reason uh, is that the, the purpose of the transfer itself was to keep the property safe in case Penn is sued. 
In other words, the purpose of the transfer was to ensure that even if Penn were pursued by creditors, the couple could remain living at the property. The very purpose of the transfer was to keep the family home safe from creditors. I know so, the, so the very fact that you rely upon to say that there is here a joint endeavour, constructive trust, is what will defeat the purpose of the joint endeavour. Because if you're, su if you're successful in that argument, I, will it not be the case that the trustee in bankruptcy will petition to sue, uh, to petition for orders for judicial sale in respect of the property? They may well Section do... Section 66G application, for example. Indeed, they may well do so, Your Honour. But, but given the case, but given the fact that the relationship has already broken down, which is a precondition to the existence or the, or the recognition of such a trust by, um, by the court, um, that, is, that is beside the point. And I, I note, for example, at paragraph um, 10 of the facts, indeed, that uh, Den demanded that Penn leave the house. I see. For these reasons, uh, Your Honours, a constructive trust of the Baumgartner and Baumgartner kind should be recognised in this case because it would be now unconscionable for Den, given all of Penn's financial contributions, uh, to assert an entire beneficial interest in the property. I turn then to my second submission, which is that there are no grounds for the denial of equitable relief to the appellant. It is now well established that courts will not withhold equi equitable relief from a party merely because an act referable to the equity sought was tainted by some illegality. An authority for that proposition, Your Honours, is the 1995 decision of this court in Nelson and Nelson. Where the creation of a trust is not expressly or impliedly prohibited by statute, in order to determine whether or not that trust should be enforced, regard is had to the underlying purpose of the statute. Um, and that principle was also set out in Nelson and Nelson. In the present case, the creation of a trust is not expressly or impliedly prohibited by any statute. Instead, the relevant illegality consists in the transfer, which was effected to defraud Penn's creditors. Transfer of title for such a purpose, for the defrauding of creditors, is made an offence under section 266, subsection 3 of the Bankruptcy Act. The relevant inquiry, Your Honours, therefore, is to ask what the policy and object of the Bankruptcy Act is, and then to determine whether, if finding in favour of the appellant would further the purposes and objects of the Bankruptcy Act. Now, quite clearly, the object of the Bankruptcy Act is to divide the property up, uh, divide the property of a bankrupt up uh, in pursuit of the policy that creditors ought have their due. A more specific object of the Act, in furtherance of this broader object, is to prevent the defrauding of creditors by the concealment of property um, through transfers. In PT Garuda Indonesia and Grelman, um, decided in the Federal Court in 1992. The Court at 209 explained that the one great object of the original Bankruptcy Act and all successor Bankruptcy Acts is to prevent debtors from dealing with their property in any way to the prejudice of their creditors. Not only is the defrauding of creditors made an offence under Section 266, Subsection 3 of the Bankruptcy Act, but the Act also provides for the voiding of transfers made for the purpose of defrauding creditors under Section 122. So was there any application made when the, the proceedings were before the primary judge under, for example, Section 37A of the Conveyancing Act to set aside the transfer? It was or whatever the equivalent is in Victoria, if we're in Victoria, we're in Victoria. I, think, I believe we're in New South Wales, Your Honour. Um, it was Collins Street that threw me. Indeed. <laughs> I, I believe the property was in, in Vaucluse, though, um, uh, Your Honour. Um, However, um, on this point, uh, I have not received any instructions uh, in respect of what happened in the courts below um, or indeed whether the official trust trustee has sought an order under, for example, section 121 of the Bankruptcy Act. Uh, and I would also note um, that in the clarifications, uh, issues arising in respect of the Bankruptcy Act are somewhat outside the, the grounds of appeal. Stepped outside my jurisdiction, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> in light, however, Your Honour, uh, of, the, um, uh, of this examination of the objects and the policies of the Act, it is plain that denying relief to the appellant would run against the policy of the statute, for a refusal to recognise a trust would in fact enable the defrauding of creditors, uh, the opposite of the Act's intention. The respondent appears to concede this in their written submissions. However, they invite the court um, from 4.5 of their sum written submissions onwards uh, to depart from Nelson and Nelson and return to what they call a strict approach to illegality. 
That is, the respondent contends that considerations of policy should be put aside and that the court should deny equitable relief to the appellant merely on the ground that the creation of a trust was tainted by Penn and Den's illegal purpose. Your Honours, there is no reason for this court now to depart from Nelson and Nelson. The rationale for the more flexible approach to illegality in that case is made very clear by the present case. If Penn's illegality is relied on as a reason to deny the appellant equitable relief, then the illegal object um, of defrauding creditors would paradoxically be furthered. And for this reason, the court should stick to Nelson and Nelson and should, in the present case, uh, grant a, uh, a grant declaration of trust of the kind we seek for the appellant. I turn then to the second ground upon which the respondent seeks to deny equitable relief to the appellant, uh, and that is based on the principle that he who comes to equity must come with clean ha hands. It is well established that courts may withhold equitable relief from a party who is engaged in improper conduct which has an immediate and necessary relation to the equity sued for. An authority for that proposition is Catty and Proprietary Limited, decided in 2009 in the New South Wales Court of Appeal. However, Your Honours, it is our submission that because the trustee is the party, is the appellant in this case, that in effect their hands have been washed. And for this reason, uh, for this proposition, we rely on the 2004 uh, New South Wales Court of Appeal decision of Carl Sullivan Enterprises Proprietary Limited, where Justice Beasley, uh, as Her Honour then was, said at page 623... As Her Excellency. As Her Excellency, indeed now, <laughs> indeed now, uh, then was, uh, said at page 623, uh, that when liquidators, uh, when a company comes to court seeking equity, um, when controlled by its liquidators, that that has the effect of cleansing the, cleansing the hands of the party. And for that reason, because the appellant comes with clean hands, equitable relief should not be denied. If there are no further questions, may it please the court. Thank you, Mr Noble. Your Honours, there are essentially three issues on this appeal. Firstly, whether a trust arose at any stage of the relationship between the parties, Penn and Den. Secondly, if a trust did arise, in what proportions? And thirdly, whether equitable relief will be barred to the appellant. Today, I will be addressing the first two of these issues. I will first address the appellant's arguments in relation to a 60% purchase money resulting trust. Secondly, I will address their arguments in relation to an express trust. Thirdly, I will address their arguments in relation to a <coughs> common intention constructive trust. And finally, we submit that the court should not impose a remedial constructive trust. In the alternative, we submit that if such a remedial constructive trust is to be imposed, it should be significantly adjusted um, in favour of Den by reference to his contributions to the joint venture, their shared family life. My learned junior will be dealing with the final issue, the grounds upon which equitable relief is barred to the appellant. Our submission, in summary, is that the appeal should be dismissed as no trust arose, and even if it did, equitable relief is not available to the appellant. As such, the legal and beneficial interest in the Collins Street property are held in their entirety by Dan. If I can now move to my first submission, that no purchase money resulting trust arose in 2002. The appellant's contention is that Penn holds a 60% beneficial interest in the property by reason of a resulting trust arising at the point of purchase. We submit that the court should not find that a trust arose at the point of purchase, and in making this submission, we rely upon the following four key facts. First, the parties at the per point of purchase were in a committed relationship that was a relationship of the same character as a formal marital relationship. Secondly, they purchased the property as a family home and chose it together, and this goes to their intention as to equal future enjoyment of the property. Thirdly, they registered jointly on the title, and were jointly liable under the mortgage. This goes to their equal responsibility and intention to enjoy it equally. Finally, Den proceeded to carry out extensive renovations on the property and took care of all household chores, although this is only in relevant insofar as to the intention of the, pro the parties at the point of purchase. Having regard to these facts, we make two submissions. Firstly, that any presumption of a resulting trust is rebutted <coughs> because the intention of the parties at the time of purchase was that they would share any beneficial interest equally. And secondly, in the alternative, that the court should reconsider the earlier authority of Calvary and Green 
and find that the presumption of advancement should apply as between de facto couples, such as Penn and Dan. If I may start with my first of these submissions, the rebuttal of the presumption of a resulting trust, I'll take your honours to the relevant case law. My learned friend has already taken your <coughs> honours to the case of Calvary and Green and addressed the rebuttable presumption of a resulting trust. This equitable presumption can be rebutted or qualified by a common intention that the beneficial title be held equally. As such, the relevant consideration is what Penn and Den intended at the point of purchase. We do note that there is limited direct evidence as to the stated intention of the parties at the time of purchase. However, intention may be inferred from their conduct at the point of purchase. On the facts before your honours, this court should infer an intention that the parties intended to hold the title in equal shares. Firstly, the facts point to an intention be between the parties that the property would be shared e jointly. The parties purchased it as a family home and they chose it together. Furthermore, they registered jointly and were jointly liable under the mortgage. Secondly, whilst Den did not make equal contributions to the purchase price, he later contributed in the form of renovations which are likely to added, have added to the property's value, something of obvious financial benefit to both parties. It is our submission that the court should infer that at the time of purchase, both Penn and Den had at least considered the possibility that this would occur, that in exchange for Penn taking on a greater financial responsibility, at the point of purchase, Den would take on responsibilities in other areas of their relationship, contributing to their joint relationship, which way they would both enjoy. Can I just ask you this? Did the primary judge make findings as to the common intention of the parties at the time of purchase? No, Your Honour. We do not have um, available to us um, the findings of the primary judge, unless Your Honour believes that is the case. Well, there, I, I know there was a finding in favour of Den. Yes, Your Honour. Uh, the, the if there primary were findings judge of fact at the first instance, then it wouldn't be open to us, would it not, in the absence of any challenge to the finding of facts, to overturn them? You'd have yes, those Your in Honour, your paper, would case. you not? Um, Nonetheless, I will address my learned Indeed. colleagues' arguments in relation to this point, just in case there is any lingering concern on the bench. Um, finally, certain assumptions can be made based on the relationship between the parties and the norms of such a relationship. <coughs> in Cummins, this court considered a property dispute between the bankrupt estate of Mr Cummins and his wife, Mrs Cummins. Mr and Mrs Cummins had purchased a family home and lived in it for many years. Although they registered jointly, Mr Cummins contributed only 23% of the purchase price and Ms Cummins contributed 77 The majority concluded that where a husband and wife purchased a family home or a matrimonial home, each contributing to the purchase price and title was, as here, taken in their names jointly, it can be inferred that it was intended that each spouse would have a one-half interest in the property, regardless of their respective contributions to the price. It is our submission that in this inference should also be made here. The only material distinction between the facts in Cummins and the facts here today are that Mr Cummins and Mrs Cummins were married at the point of purchase, where Penn and Den were not. It is readily apparent that there is no distinction in substance between the re marital relationship in Cummins and the relationship between Penn and Den as at 2002. Penn and Den had been living together for two years at the time of choosing this house. They were in a committed domestic relationship that in all material respects resembled a marital relationship. They shared financial responsibilities as evidenced by the shared mortgage and they were mutually committed to a shared life. It is our submission that the relationship between Penn and Den resembled a marital relationship and there is no proper basis for a marital relationship to be treated differently to a de facto relationship in this regard. Furthermore, at paragraph 69, the co this court implicitly indicated some disapproval for the exclusive and particular significance of marriage cast by Justices Mason and Brennan in Calvary. At the very least, their honours indicated that it was open for reconsideration. Um, as such, it is our submission that the court should find that the presumption of a resulting trust is rebutted on these facts. If your honours have no further questions in relation to this point, I will move on now to the presumption of advancement. And the alternative, if the court does not accept that the presumption of a resulting trust is rebutted, we submit that the court should find that no resulting trust arises in this case by reason of an alternate and in, in uh, presumption of advancement. We are largely in agreement with our learned friends in relation to the presumption of advancement. However, we do differ in what we regard as the cause or justification for the presumption. Although it may first have been formulated 
as a response to the natural obligation to support between of the parties, we submit that it is better now characterized as arising from the prima facie probability of a beneficial interest being intended in situations, um, being intended to be shared equally in situations where the presumption has been applied. This is consistent with Chief Justice Dixon in Worth and Worth at 237 and approved by Chief Justice Gibbs in Calvary and Green at 249. Although we note that this is not settled law, we would ask the court to, invoice, uh, to endorse this as the foundation, having regard to the nature of modern relationships and the lack of a, a natural propensity to advance or uh, care for others that we submit is no longer the case in modern relationships. We note, as our learned friends have noted, that the presumption of advancement was, in 1984, in a decision of this court, found not to arise between de facto as opposed to married couples. There are a number of compelling reasons why this position should be revised. In Calvary and Green, there were two significant and interrelated reasons for the distinction drawn by this court in this regard. First, because cohabiting married, unmarried couples did not, in the eyes of their honours, intend their relationship to have the same consequences upon their property as married couples, and secondly, and closely related to this first reason, their honours considered that the differential treatment of married couples and de facto couples under the Family Law Act, as it stood in 1984, particularly in relation to property, meant that the relationship had significantly different actual bearing upon shared property rights of the parties. Your Honours will find this in the judgment of Jesus, Justice Mason and Brennan at page 260. It is our submission that neither rationale has continuing force in modern society for three significant reasons. Firstly, there have been a number of significant changes to the Family Law Act since 1984 that render the treatment of property in dispute between married couples and de facto couples near identical. Um, in the decision of Ryan and Ryan, specifically at paragraph 68, Your Honour Justice Ward noted that the provisions of the Family Law Act that apply to de facto couples and property disputes being Part 8, 8AB of the Act, are now effectively and in significant respects identical to Part 8 of the Act, which applies to property disputes between married couples. Indeed, in Cummins, the decision I took your honours to previously, the court noted that these statutory innovations may bear upon further development of this principle in equity, although they left this matter for another day as it was not relevant to that decision, which concerned a marital couple. That was at Cummins at 69. As such, Unlike the legislative scheme that existed in 1984, it is no longer the case that statute treats shared property between married couples differently to that between de facto couples. I note that my learned friend has relied on explanatory memoranda and other material to indicate that it was not the intention of Parliament um, to treat these two couples differently. And indeed, they cannot be treated differently in all respects. In terms of evidential requirements, there is an evidential requirement that, uh, that de facto couples must satisfy in order to prove that their relationship meets the requirements of a de facto couple in section 4AA of the Act that is not required by marital couples as they have a marriage certificate. However, in significant respects in terms of once that evidential burden is satisfied, um, the relationship is in significant respects tr uh, treated as, as having the same bearing on shared property. Secondly, in modern society, de facto relationships are increasingly common and carry the same commitment and familial obligations as marital relationships. So you take judicial note of that? We do take judicial note of that. Um, in contemporary society, um, it has been expressly re recognised in the New South Wales um, Supreme Court in Lewin Adamson in 2003 that community acceptance of de facto relationships has significantly increase, increased and they have become much more frequent. It is not my intention to submit that that is binding on this court, but merely indicative of a general change in society. Um, furthermore, in Cummins, at paragraph 68, the court cast doubt on the particular and exclusive significance attached to marriage by Mason and Brennan in Calvary and Green. Um, and they noted that marriage is indeed often defeated by divorce, um, much more frequently in modern society than it was at that point in Calvary and Green, and that was at 68 and 69 of Cummins. Indeed, even in Calvary and Green, Justice Gibbs, in dissent, held that a de facto relationship did carry the necessary degree of commitment and permanence to enliven the presumption of advancement. Um, furthermore, um, just to uh, address any lingering <coughs> concerns on the bench, the presumption of advancement is rebuttable. Were a de facto relationship in which couples were, as a matter of fact, not actually committed to each other and did not intend their relationship bearing on their property rights to enliven the presumption, it would be rebutted by evidence of this lack of commitment. 
As such, there is no real risk that extending the presumption to de facto couples would allow the presumption to apply too widely. What do you say about the proposition that it's not a true presumption? Your Honour, if it were, um, in, in, if it, the bench chose to reject the presumption of advancement in its entirety, is that what Your Honour is accepting? I just have regard to, uh, to Justice um, Hayden's judgment in Danburg, I think it's Danburg and Danburg, in which His Honour considered that it wasn't strictly a presumption as such. It was merely, um, is your honour referring merely to? Merely an evidentiary principle. Um, and or an evidentiary um, In that regard, we have a structural analysis consistent with the as assessment in Jacobs and the Law of Trust and a number of other texts. However, were this to be merely an evidentiary burden, it would have no real significance on the argument today and that, that um, the presumption of advancement or an evidential um, assumption of advancement would nevertheless um, act to rebut similarly the presumption of a resulting trust. And that in that way, it would more fall in line with our first argument, but nonetheless, uh, our, the re result is consistent. Yes, thank you. Um, there's no strict rule governing when this court will depart from previous authority. However, as is the case here, it will weigh in favour of the departure where previous decisions have been weakened by experience or subsequent decisions. It was held by John and Commissioner of Taxation at tab, uh, page 438 and 439. As such, we submit that this court should depart from this previous authority and having regard to these social and legislative changes, extend the presumption of advancement. We do note, as our learned friends have noted, that this is a rebuttable presumption. Um, however, in this regard, we would refer to the factual matters I already discussed in my first submission, um, that this presumption is not rebutted on the facts as every indication that they intended to share it jointly. As such, it is our submission that no purchase money resulting trust arose in 2002. Um, if not, your honours have no further questions, I will move on to my next submission. The appellants have submitted that an express trust arose by reason of the party's conversation in 2016 at paragraphs 8 to paragraphs 9 of the facts. This trust lacks two essential requirements, the certainty of intention to create a trust and evidence in writing. In light of this, it cannot arise. Firstly, in relation to certainty of intention, it is our submission that the conversation between the parties in September 2016 clearly lacks this certainty. My learned colleagues have pointed to Den's statement that the transfer would be of legal title to hold for both of us as evidence for intention to create an express trust. However, this disregards um, some significant matters. Penn was not legally trained and as such would not have been aware of the implications of the phrase legal title. The relevant intention is that of the settler, the person who is granting an interest. Um, the person creating the trust, not the intended trustee. This was held by Justices Hayden and Crennan in Burns and Kendall at paragraph 113. The legal language, legal title, does not objectively manifest an intention to create a trust, as people who are not legally trained, such as Penn, are not normally aware of this legal implication, of the legal implication of the word legal title. In relation to my learned colleague's submissions as to osmosis, the... Um, <laughs> The relevant intention is that which is construed, is construed objectively by what a standard person would perceive the conversation to mean. Objectively, people would take legal title to mean title, the entirety of the property. Any further understanding attributes specialised legal knowledge to the average person which they do not have. Um, furthermore, in relation to the phrase hold for both of us, we construe this as manifesting in that he would allow his partner to continue to live there, but it does not objectively manifest an intention to create a trust. Secondly, and in the alternative, this express trust over land must fail because the agreement is unenforceable. It is not in writing, and the fraud exception to section 23C is not made out. Um, yes. Ms. Ray, can I ask a question in relation to that? Um, and in your written submissions, you refer to sections 23C, 1A and 1B of the Conveyancing Act for the requirement for the Declaration of Trust itself to be in writing. Um, what do you say about, in particular, Section 23C1B, which is expressly applies to the Declaration of Trust and requires, rather, that the manifestation of the intention to create a trust be evidenced in writing? And subsequent case law, which says that it's sufficient for there to be an oral declaration 
provided that there is then a reduction to writing of the fact of the declaration, which is then signed. Um, Your Honours, uh, you, you are correct to point to my submissions. That was, in fact, a typo. We intended to refer to A and B, as both of these um, have been held to rely to declarations in different courts. Um, section 23 CA has been held to apply to a declaration of a trust, as it does appear to on the facts, but then Section 23 C 1 B has carved out another requirement. Um, regardless of whether the requirement was that the agreement be evidence in writing or merely the lesser evidentiary requirement of Section B, um, there's no evidence on the facts that they um, had any evidence in writing of their agreement to carve out an interest in the property. And as such, nonetheless, this requirement is not satisfied in our submission, on, on our construction of the facts. There's nothing on the facts to indicate that they evidenced any agreement of the trust in writing. Um, this effect of the statute of frauds exception, even though an express trust, is that even though an express trust does not meet the requirements set out in statute, it may nonetheless be enforced. However, this exception to section 23C of the Conveyancing Act is not made out. This is because this exception is limited to cases in which the settler would not have transferred their interest but for the assurance of a trust. This is the view taken in ISPT nominees and Commissioner of State Revenue at paragraph 336, um, which your honour will find at the blue tab on your bench book if you wish to look at it. It was also the view taken by Hayden, Leeming and Turner in Equity, Doctrines and Remedies at paragraph 12, one, subsection 125, and also the view taken by the author of Jacob Coob's Law of Trust at page 72. The effect, this effectively imports a causation test. The court must ask, would Penn have transferred their interest but for the words by den of legal title? And whichever way you look at it, Penn would have. Penn immediately and enthusiastically agreed to the transfer of title. They sought no clarification as to the extent of the transfer or the form in which the retained interest would take. Secondly, their immediate response was to emphasise that they were sorry to have put Den through all of this. This act, at its core, was motivated by remorse, not just for the affair, but also for Penn's own carelessness, which put the family home at risk. Furthermore, when Den asked Penn to move out of the home in December 2016, Penn complied. Penn would not have done this if they believed they had a remaining interest in the property. As such, maintaining an equitable interest in the property cannot have been central to Penn's decision to agree to transfer property to Den. Nothing about Penn's conduct demonstrates that an insurance of a trust was central to, or even part of, the decision to transfer the property to Den. As such, the requirement that the assurance of a trust was central to the settler's agreement to transfer property is not made out on these facts. As such, it is our submission that this express trust must fail for two reasons. Firstly, it was not in writing and thus is unenforceable. And secondly, and the alternative, because the settler Penn lacked intention to create a trust. If your honours have no further question in relation to that point, I'll move on to my third submission. Yes, thank you, Swain. I now turn to my submission in, relating to, in relation to constructive trusts. My learned friends have advanced constru as constructive trust on two grounds. Firstly, the common intention constructive trust. That, at the point of purchase of the property, the common intention was that it would be shared jointly which Penn then relied on to their detriment by making contributions to the mortgage and the purchase price. The crux of this argument is that, at 2002, the parties had a common intention that Penn would share an interest in the property. It is the central factual conclusion they invite the court to draw. Second, the unconscionability constructive trust, or the Baumgartner trust. The appellant has framed this argument slightly differently, but it is largely the same argument. The appellants have alleged that in 2002, or consequently in their oral submissions, the parties came commenced a joint venture, their intention to share this house as a family home. Central to this argument is that, in 2002, it was a party's intention that property would be shared jointly. Unlike the common intention constructive trust, the Baumgartner Trust grants relief because it would be unconscionable to allow the party to enjoy the property in a way that was never intended. It is our submission that both arguments are defeated by the common intention of the parties as manifested by the conversation and conduct in 2016. And this turns on the differing construction of that conversation between me and my learned friend. A common intention constructive trust is displaced because the party's common intention was displaced by this later common intention. The Baumgartner constructive trust is defeated on a slightly different technical reason because the parties have formed an express intention about what is to happen to their property upon the failure of a joint venture and it is not unequitable or unconscionable to hold them to that agreement. That un, um, 
The intention of the parties is relevant to a Baumgartner constructive trust because where the parties have formed an express intention about what is to happen to the property in the circumstances that have arisen, there is nothing unconscionable in holding the parties to that agreement. That was in Musinski and Dodds at 618 by Justice Dean and applied in Rules Fishy Bites by eight, uh, paragraph 82 by Justice Campbell. Um, importantly, unconscionability is tested at the end of the relationship, not at the outset, because at the time at wh when the court decides whether or not a constructive trust is to be imposed um, arises is when the joint endeavour has concluded. It is only then that they can tell whether it is unconscionable to allow the parties' rights to be split in accordance with their legal entitlement. That was Anson and Anson in 2004 in the New South Wales Supreme Court at 716, again by Justice Campbell, paragraph 36. It is our submission that the parties have manifested an intention that, in the event that the relationship dissolves and the creditors come for the home, Den was to enjoy the property, not Penn. Central to this is the conversation between the parties in 2016. In this conversation, the parties expressly considered the possibility of creditors seeking to take Penn's interest in the party to settle their debts. Although they do not expressly consider the possibility of a relationship breakdown, it is implicit that this would have been on their minds. Penn had just revealed his affair, and the relationship came to an end only three months later. And as such, it is unarguable in our eyes that it would have been in their con contemplation. In contemplation of these very factors, the parties agreed that Penn would transfer his interest to Den. The purpose of this was twofold. Firstly, Penn wanted to avoid cred Den ceasing to be able to live in the family home. They were not just concerned about the loss of a valuable asset, they were concerned about the loss of a family home, one that Den had made significantly more contributions to than Penn in the form of renovations and ongoing housework. Secondly, and closely related to this first reason, remorse. Penn was, at their core, unapologetic for having put the family home at risk by their own carelessness and stupidity. We would also... Um, this conversation was not about protecting property from creditors. It was also about Penn having put the family home in jeopardy. In Muskinski and Dodds, Justice Dean expressly rejected the adoption of the US principle of unjust enrichment into Australian law. Conclusively, his honour ruled that the mere fact that it would be unjust or unfair in a situation of discord for the owner of a legal strait to assert his ownership against other providers, um, it is of itself no mandate for judicial declaration that the ownership in whole or in part lies in equity in that other. Finally, if your honours are not with us on this point, is our submission that Den's contribution under a constructive trust should be significantly positively increased to reflect his extensive renovations as his homemaking in Turner, um, consistent with the authorities in Turner, Miller and Baumgartner at, 100, Baumgartner at 157. May it please the court, those are my submissions. May it please the court. Your honours, my colleague has addressed the question today of whether a trust in favour of Penn exists over the Collins Street house. As you'll see from page six of our written submissions, the remainder of my points today will step beyond that question. Assuming that you find the existence of a trust in, in Penn's favour, we will submit that there are two alternate reasons why your honours should not allow enforcement of that trust. The first of those reasons is that the trust existing between Penn and Den is tainted by illegality as it has been entered into for an illegal purpose. And second, if your honours are not with us on the illegality point, that the equitable doctrine of unclean hands similarly prevents the enforcement of the trust. R your honours, if you find in favour of us on either of our points today, you should prevent the enforcement of the trust in its entirety. Now turning to the first of these submissions being illegality. At this point, Your Honours, it's useful for me to take you to the provisions of the Bankruptcy Act 1966 Commonwealth that we will be considering today. Those provisions may be found at tab three of the respondents' bundles. If Your Honours would, please. Yes. Yes, so tab three, Your Honours. Thank you. So looking, starting at the first section that's marked out at tab three, you'll find section 120. Um, as your honours will see from that highlighted section, um, this section renders a transfer void if no consideration or less than market value was provided for the transfer of a property prior to bankruptcy within five years. Turning over, your honours, you should have section 121. Again, from the highlighted points, it can be seen that this section similarly renders a transfer void if the main purpose of that transfer was to avoid creditors prior to bankruptcy. Finally, on the next page, 
Your Honours will find section 266, subsection 3, which similarly provides for a criminal sanction in the event of a transfer which is made a year before bankruptcy with intention to avoid creditors. Now, it's our submission that each of these provisions equally apply to the transfer of legal title in the Collins Street House made on 25 September 2016. No serious claim can be made to the contrary. However, where the central dispute arises today, Your Honours, is whether the Bankruptcy Act and those provisions specifically have any bearing on a trust made in favour of Penn. We say that they do. Now, in order to make this submission, we look to the seminal authority in this area of this court in Nelson and Nelson, 1995, particularly page 552, which you will find at your tab 17, and which I believe is highlighted by a yellow flag, Your Honours, if that is of assistance. Now, as my learned friend has alluded to, in Nelson, three pathways to a finding of illegality were set out in that top paragraph. We do not submit that illegality arises on the first or second pathway, which turn on a statute expressly or impliedly prohibiting a trust. Indeed, as we've just considered, none of these sections consider trusts in favour of the owner of the property. They expressly prohibit transfers of the property, which is directed towards attempted divestments. Our submission today, Your Honours, is based on the third pathway. That pathway is explained on this page, and as you'll see from the highlighted sections, it says, I quote, illegality may arise where contracts and trusts not directly contrary to the provisions of the statute by reason of any express or implied prohibition in the statute, but which are associated with or in furtherance of an illegal purpose. Further down, it's explained that this arises not from a direct legislative prohibition, but from the policy of the law. And as our learned friends have explained, there is roughly three steps to this consideration. First, we must articulate what the policy of the law is, in this case, the Bankruptcy Act, 1966. Second, we must evaluate whether, in light of that policy, the trust should be rendered illegal. And third, we must consider any relevant exceptions which may yet save that equitable remedy. However, I note today that in their oral submissions, my learned friends have not put any of those exceptions forward. And so we'll confine our analysis to the first two steps. And so this is where we turn to the first of these questions, being the policy of the law. And I predict that this will be the most contentious point today between myself and my learned friends. And this is addressed at our submissions 4.2 and 4.3. Now, we say that the policy of the Bankruptcy Act is this. To prevent conduct that is incompatible with the efficient, transparent, and impartial process of liquidating the bankrupt's assets for the benefits of themselves the creditors and the wider community. Now, our construction varies from my learned friends in two important ways. First, my learned friends construe the Bankruptcy Act as solely for the benefit of creditors. They say so unequivocally in their written submissions and have adopted that position in their oral submissions today. Second, implicit in this suggestion is that the Bankruptcy Act's purpose is achieved by the repayment of the debt to the creditors solely. We say that this is not the case, Your Honours. Now, in construing the policy of the Act, there are three components that must be considered by this Court today. They were set out in Nelson, and those are the purpose, scope, and language of the Act. And it must be borne in mind, Your Honours, that the policy of the Act can operate on matters and facts that do not even appear to come within the scope of the statute. This was said in Nelson at page 553. So turning to the first of those in this year, Your Honours, which is that of purpose. At our 4.3.1, we say that the purpose is to provide an efficient and impartial process for the re repayment of debts to allow the bankrupt to restart their financial affairs. This accords with both how Justice Kirby in Pyramid Building Society and Terry explained the historical role of insolvency legislation and how the ALRC, in its General Insolvency Report of 1988, which you'll find at your tab six with an orange flag, Your Honours, outlines the aims of insolvency legislation. Looking at that report, Your Honours, we find three comments on the purpose of insolvency legislation. The first is that it has a fundamental purpose to, I quote, provide a fair and orderly process for dealing with the financial dealings of companies. Second, it is a system that is, I quote, imp 
impartial, efficient, and expeditious. And third, I quote, uh, a law that, I quote, provides a convenient means of collecting or recovering payment. We submit that those functions are reflected by the sanctions of the, uh, the sections, I withdraw that, of the Bankruptcy Act, to which I've previously taken your honours today. Each of section 120, 121, and 266 prioritises the accounting of property to be vested in the bankrupt, pursuant to section 116, subsection 1, so that it may be distributed to creditors in an orderly way. Can I just ask you this? How would refusing to enforce the trust, assuming a trust were to be established, how would re refusing to enforce it assist at least one of the purposes of the bankruptcy legislation, which as I understand you accept, is to provide a fair and orderly process for dealing with the financial dealings of the bankrupt? To, to distill our point very, uh, very clearly, Your Honour, we would say centrally that the way it assists is by upholding the process of the Bankruptcy Act. We'll touch on this later in our other submissions, but we say that by this court endorsing the trust made out in favour of Penn, this would go to undermine the process of the Bankruptcy Act for the return of assets to the creditors. Now, this actually ties in quite closely to our submissions on scope today, Your Honours, which is the second indicia of the policy of the law. And we say that the scope of the Bankruptcy Act extends to prohibiting conduct that interferes with the process of repayment. Now, unlike the approach our learned friends have adopted, we say this is not a results-based approach. The policy of the Act is not satisfied merely because the creditors are repaid. Indeed, Your Honours, there are many ways in which the creditors may be repaid, which would be entirely unsatisfactory to the Bankruptcy Act. For instance, one creditor could be arbitrarily preferenced over another in the return of debts. Rather, we say it's the process through which they are repaid, which is the essential policy of the law. It's enforcing a fair, efficient and impartial process that sets out the parameters of the scope of the Bankruptcy Act. Is this rather a situation of form over substance? To, to an extent, yeah. um, and to one extent this does reveal some of the inherent deficiencies of the flexible approach endorsed by Nelson, Your Honours, which is that our finding on the policy of the Act today is inherent to whether you enforce or don't enforce the trust. And depending on how censorious uh, Your Honours are... Well, they're very censorious. <laughs> not, not very good for me. <laughs> Uh, a, a different finding way may be made. And so we'll draw on that of what the consequences of this violation are in our next submission. But ba uh, to distill, we say that that is the policy of the law, um, the, uh, the process of repayment, and that the trust offends this policy. And so that takes us to the next step of the consideration, which is to, establish, which is to look at if Penn's conduct in establishing a trust in favour of themselves for the purpose of retaining an interest in the Collins Street House, while simultaneously avoiding the claims of creditors, contradicts the policy of the Bankruptcy Act, on what basis should this contravention give rise to the prevention of the enforcement of the trust in this court today? Your Honours, we put two alternate positions to you today. The first, as my learned friends have alluded to, is that we say that this court should return to adopt a strict approach to illegality such that where illegality is present, the loss should be left to lie where it falls. Or, second, in any event, if your honours are not with us on that point, even if a more flexible lens is adopted, that the facts before you today still militate towards this court denying equitable relief. Looking first to the strict approach, which is to let the loss lie where it falls, and dealt with at our submission 4.6. We acknowledge that this approach has not found favour with this court uh, and was rejected by the major majority in Nelson. Nevertheless, we say that there is some scope to overturn that aspect of Nelson. And we make this um, point in two parts. First, we say that the merits of the strict approach were undervalued by this court in Nelson. And second, that the crystallisation of some surrounding principles of illegality have rendered this approach more appropriate today. Um, the merits of the approach were well recognised in Nelson by Gummo and Dean, where they acknowledged that a strict approach encourages compliance with the law through the fret of a sharp and broad sword. While adopting an approach that, to let the loss lie where it falls may seem to produce inequitable results, there are several reasons why this is not a problem. First, a clear category of exceptions have emerged from the dicta of Justice McHugh in Nelson at page 613, in which, despite a finding of illegality, <coughs> 
a tr um, equitable relief may still be allowed. Those exceptions have been subsequently endorsed by this court in Fitzgerald and F.J. Leonhardt in 1997. It follows that the strict approach won't affect scenarios arising from fraud against the claimant or where the illegal purpose has not been carried to fruition. And so it does not have the unjust um, and harsh edges that it once did. Further, we note that, as was noted by the UK Supreme Court in Patel, at paragraph 91, the majority cited the dictum of Lord Mansfield in Holman and Johnson, that while an, an entirely arbitrary result may not be justified, that the rule of public policy is not designed to achieve justice between the parties. Instead, Your Honours, the focus is on ensuring compliance with the law. Has Patillon Mazai been well received in, the, by, in academic commentary, Mr Hetherington? Uh, no, um, you, no. Your, your honours have adventure. None of the approaches have been well received in academic commentary. <laughs> but, but uh, in any event, we say that um, the emphasis here is on ensuring compliance with the policy of the law. And as we've outlined today, not enforcing this trust would be the and to let the loss lie where it falls would be the best approach. Now. Assuming your honour, in the event that your honours are not with me on the strict approach, we turn to consider the, the flexible approach that was endorsed by this court in um, Nelson. And the indicia for that were set out by um, Justice McHugh. In, um, apologies, your honours. The, uh, they were set out by Justice McHugh at page 613. Yes. And broadly speaking, there are three indicia. That the um, non-enforcement of equity is necessary, is not a disproportionate response and is not barred by sanctions, uh, by other s legislative sanctions set out. Looking to the first of these points on the necessity, we say that it is necessary for the purpose of the Act. And at the risk of repetition, Your Honours, we say that not enforcing this trust allows the Bankruptcy Act to utilise its other provisions that are necessary for the return of this uh, property to the creditors. For instance, Your Honours, we say that it would be entirely possible for our learned friends to return to court tomorrow and seek to make an application on 120 or 121 and to have the property returned to the creditors without requiring us to alter the law of illegality. And are you suggesting you wouldn't take an ancient and estoppel point there? We may perhaps, Your Honour. Yes, <laughs> but, so. but nevertheless, <laughs> the, the principle still stands that um, with regard to the appropriate pathway through which the Act prescribes, it should be most protected. With regards to the necessity, we note that this is an attempt to conceal a high value asset, um, uh, two million dollars at last valuation, your honours. And so therefore we say that there is a role for this court to not endorse conduct of that scale. Finally, we come to the last point, which is the sanctions, and perhaps the most difficult for us today, your honours, because the Act does indeed set out some substantial sanctions, that of the voiding of the legal transfer, and additionally, also of the potential imprisonment. The highest we can put our point here today, Your Honours, is that while these sanctions exist, there is nothing in the Act to suggest that they are the sole sanctions for this conduct. And so where the policy of the law is the predominant consideration, we say that there still remains some scope for equity to intervene. Finally, we note that while Justice Tui and Nelson did acknowledge that the policy of the law is not <coughs> the only consideration and that we must also consider issues of unfairness and unjust enrichment, we say that the policy of the law is the predominant consideration for your honours today, as it is necessary to disincentivise such conduct of concealing of assets, and that in any event, in a similar vein to the submissions we've put to you, that there are other pathways through which the creditors may retain their funds. If your honours have no further questions uh, on these, our submissions regarding the policy of the Bankruptcy Act... Well, can I just ask, ask this question? How is it that that it disincentivises conduct of this kind, in effect, to refuse to enforce a trust which will, from a practical point of view, mean that the parties who have sought to put their assets beyond the reach of creditors have succeeded in so doing. I take your point, Your Honour, and I think the the way the, uh, I submit that the disincentive is provided in the fact that no bankrupt will be able to rely on a trust for the return of their property in the, um, in the event of bankruptcy, as is the case here today. Indeed, Penn will suffer consequences for this attempt to conceal the asset, and so future bankrupts will be made aware that um, an attempt to conceal their assets will not end favourably, as indeed it may not in the case today.
And so we say that that's the, the overarching disincentive. And, and that is, I perhaps sit on a small scale. Sorry, Your Honour. Can I also ask, uh, so far we've been talking about the trust. Is there any distinction to be made in the application of illegality, and perhaps you might address this when it gets to unclean hands, um, in the application of either um, principle to the range of trusts that have been um, put by the appellants? For example, does illegality apply for the same reasons um, to bar any potential purchase money resulting trust? Um, I I indeed, as you've noted, Your Honour, the, the, the most difficult trust for us to attach the illegality to today is the purchase money resulting trust. I think dealing with the other two first arising out of the submissions, there's no question there. We say that in any event, even if you were to take out the intention manifested um, at paragraph 9 of the facts and consider the role of the purchase money resulting trust in comparison with the policy of the law, We'd say that in any event, this trust should also not be enforced, as it still operates to circumvent the method of the Act. Um, Your Honours, I note I have a minute, so I might very briefly touch on the, the unclean hands um, question and uh, rest on my submissions. Your Honours, speaking briefly, uh, the, the most potent point our learned friends have put to us is that the hands have been washed by virtue of the, um, the authority of Justice Beasley and uh, in the com context of liquidation. We'd say that bankruptcy is sufficiently different to be distinguished in this case, as Ben will uh, pen in their individual capacity will receive a very tangible benefit from the result of these proceedings today. We'd then say that the elements of necessity and immediacy between the equity sued for and the unclean hands are plainly made out, as the transaction was the thing that gave rise to the unclean hands, and the trust is the equity sued for. Your Honours, I'm content to leave the rest of that to our um, written submissions, and so if I can be of no further assistance to this court, that concludes our submissions. Thank you, Your Honours. May it please the court. The respondent submitted that there was no express trust in favour of Penn, and they point to paragraph 10 of the facts, where we're told that Penn's reluctant compliance with Den's demand to vacate the property is evidence that Penn did not think that they had a beneficial interest in the property. This is wrong for two reasons. First, in law. This conduct comes subsequent to the settlement of the trust and as such does not give any evidence of intention at the time of settlement. Second, in fact, an ouster by Den does not support the respondent's submission that Penn did not think they had an interest in the property. This is important because intention was apparent on admissible facts available to the court at the time of purchase. An express trust was created in favour of Penn and that trust should be enforced by this court <coughs> today. May it please the court. Yes, Yes, thank you, Ms. Ray. Mr. Edmonton. Well, the court thanks counsel for your submissions. The court will reserve its judgment and for